Last time we uh, learned about the Passover. Today I brought you a bunch of Hesop. How he looks like. That's how he looked like. Here, you see. It costs four shekels. You can, if someone wants to buy it, you can buy it. If you want to take a few branches, you can take it. At lunch, we even ate a piece. You can eat it, of course. It's like za'atar. We spoke about it when you dry it. You can use it also in uh, food or you can eat fresh ones. The fresh one is a little bit uh, spicy. But the main uh, component of this tree is that it saturates in itself uh, different liquids. You can see that the leaves are covered with uh, puffy uh, puffiness, the white puffiness. I will put it back in the uh, in the, in, uh, in the back. Then during the break, you can touch it. I want to remind you that we studied the Passover. The few words I will add about the unleavened bread. I remind you that this feast does not have a clear description about how to celebrate this feast because it's like a background for the Passover feast and the first sheaf the first fruit also called or the counting of Homer Gomor few words about the unleavened bread in conclusion, the Gospel of John 6, 32-35, Yeshua spoke and said, Most surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven heaven and gives lift to the world and they said to him Lord give us the bread always and Jesus said to them I am the bread of life he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst Amen. we see that the testimony of, of our Lord in the gospel of John 6 speaks that he is this bread bread is something that you never get tired of it. You can eat it every day. It's the basic food for us. Try to eat every day uh, the most tasty food that you uh, that you want, uh, meat. In one week you'll get tired of it. You'll, have, you'll want something else, an egg or cheese, but not this. Anything else but not this. But bread, you cannot get tired of it. I think this product is especially blessed by God because in the bread you have the foreshadow of our Savior, have a symbol of our Savior, which means the life in the Lord, you cannot get tired of it. It should always be the basic food, our spiritual table, and it will always give strength to the person to live a holy life. You know that uh, even if you have a dry bread, uh, when you put it in the oven, you know, y you will still have all the elements, all the vitamins from this bread. You will be much, you feel much better if you even eat a piece of meat. Or you, uh, you will develop much better. 
in the book of Leviticus, uh, in the book of Leviticus, chapter one, from one through sixteen, speaks of all the sacrifices that points to our Messiah, Jesus. It's the language of the Old Testament to speak about our Messiah through the sacrifices. Another uh, element that is used in the sacrifice, besides the grain sacrifice, you also have oil or olive oil. The unleavened bread is, sec is symbolized by the purity, symbolized uh, with the purity of the Messiah, symbolizes the clean life of our Messiah, sinless life. The leaven is always symbolized uh, with sin. We talked about the parable of Matthew 13. The leavened bread is perished very quickly. The unleavened cannot perish so quickly. It does not perish, actually. And the taste does not change also. Can you imagine the symbol? For 2,000 years, the gospel did not lose its taste, just like the matzah, just like the leaven, the unleavened. Moreover, what we had today in the news or in the newspaper, it stops being news already uh, today. Whatever you read, it's not news anymore. It passes by, but the gospel remains to be a good news for 2,000 years now. Why would they need to mix it with the oil? Before they bake it, they, when they would uh, put the dough, they would have to put the oil also in the grain. And then after mingling it, also afterwards they would have to put on top of the bread. This oil they used to bake it, the bread also. We know that Yeshua was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in him from the very beginning. Not just from the birth, but from the conception. Just like the bread from the beginning they put uh, oil. Before they make it. When he was born he made a certain way, a certain path up to year 30 years old. And all this time the Holy uh, Ghost, the Holy Spirit was in him. God's Spirit. Nobody knew that except maybe for his parents. For these 30 years, he was like bread that was being prepared. He was being prepared. And when the time came to use this bread that came from heaven, before using it, and before breaking it and using it, they had to smear this bread with oil also on top. Leviticus chapter 2 from 1 to 16 it says that you have part of the oil to put in grain before making the bread and when he's ready then you have with olive oil you have to put it on top the olive oil uh, on top of this bread. I'm just explaining the meaning Verse 4, and if you bring as an, offering, as an offering a grain offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And this anointing of oil on top of the bread very well symbolizes the baptism of Jesus Christ when the Holy Spirit comes upon him this is an external uh, anointing inside of him he was always there you could feel it if you would be with him but it would not be so vivid on the, ex on, on the outward on the external when the Holy Spirit came upon him in Matthew 3.16 
It says when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. That's why it says from inside and from outside you need to put oil. Another uh, part I want to uh, explain simultaneously. Why would Jesus have to be baptized? He is the Son of God. He did not have sin. From Romans we know that in other places, in Titus, that baptism is for sinners when they repent. We also know it from the Jewish tradition. It's called mikveh. After repentance, you have to cleanse yourself with water. Question, why Jesus would need to be baptized if he was sinless? Why did he do it? It's a very important theological uh, aspect, I think, because uh, baptism gives an opportunity to the Son of God to make a parallel with humanity. He makes himself one with the sinner by doing this, and he can only do it through the baptism. He identifies himself with the sinners, and when he has a right to die, or when he's going to die, he has a right to take our sins upon himself and die for us. That's briefly. You understand? Because the Bible says that he had to fulfill the law 100%. Our redemption is based upon the law. Leviticus 25, it's spoken about the right of purchasing a slave, a Jewish slave from the slavery. There is a certain laws. We are saved by grace. He does everything according to the law. We do not need to observe the law in order to be saved. He had to fulfill everything from beginning to end in order to bring salvation. Otherwise, otherwise the enemy of our souls could argue with him according to the law that he didn't fulfill something, but he did everything according to Torah. <coughs> That's why the baptism, the water baptism, allowed him to identify himself with humanity. And that's how he took our sins afterwards upon himself, the sins of man. He died for us and he raised and now sits at the uh, right hand of the Father. Isaiah 61 1 also says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captivities, the opening of the prison to those who are bound. This verse that shows the anointing on the outward, at the external, on the external. He is upon me, on me, on the outward because God anointed me. That's why he's called the Messiah. In Greek, Christ, uh, in English, anointed one. And the grain flour is the most pure one. They used it. In Leviticus, it says that uh, separate it and, uh, in pieces and pour out inside of this bread. God himself does it. He comes from heaven, the bread comes from heaven, and he's broken in pieces for us. That's why uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 24, 25, the traditional text that is read uh, during the communion that uh, uh, Lord Jesus, he, in this night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he thanked and he broke it and he said, Take it and eat it. This is my body. It was broken for you. Do it in my remembrance. <coughs> we said also that communion comes out of the Passover. 
That's why you cannot change the ordinance of the Passover. If you change it, then you will not be able to connect it with the communion because communion has to be with leavened br unleavened bread. With unleavened bread that symbolizes Yeshua. And another th third element, very important eleven element, we said in the sacrifice there have to be unleavened bread, olive oil, and third, it's not the most important, but uh, one without the other cannot uh, cannot be. But Leviticus 2.13 says, And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. The word salt four times in one verse is mentioned. God gives an interpretation. Salt means your covenant with God. It's your covenant with God. So if you bring an offering without salt, without the covenant with God, you will not have strength. There are many religious people who became religious and they can eat communion even, uh, can partake with in communion, but for them it's just food. They don't do it with a meaning because they have no salt, the covenant of salt, or the salt of the covenant. Even some denominations they partake, uh, take the communion with salt also. You cannot say it's right or wrong, but it's according to the scriptures. You can also point, but in this case we're talking about offering of grain. We talk about the grain offering. What is the salt? If you take the most uh, uh, wonderful products and you make food from them, the most tasty food, but you do not put salt, no one will want to eat it. Because salt is a little thing, but does a lot changes everything. And this I want to draw your attention that without salt there is no taste. In other words, there is no fullness without salt. So when man lives a religious life or a skeptic life, doesn't matter, if he doesn't have a covenant with God to a promise to live with good consciousness, like it says in the New Testament, his life remains without salt, without power. It does not have fullness. So when we live without God, it's like we're eating without salt. 20 years, 30 years. I know when the Lord came into my life and this feeling that I lived the whole life like eating without salt and someone came and said wait put some salt and I said eat and I begin to eat and they say wow this is such a good food such a good life you understand that's why salt changes everything and in the scriptures the salt is called the covenant with God do not bring sacrifice without the salt of the covenant. If we bring a powerful sacrifice to God, but we have no covenant with God, it won't be count to you. First Corinthians 13, it says that you can give all to God. You can sacrifice yourself, put on the altar, but if you do it without love, it will be just like an empty instrument. So those who don't have this soul, don't have the covenant with God, they will not have love, the natural love, God's love, 
that does not seek its own, but just loves because cannot live another way. Like the sun that, suns, that shines, it shines upon the good tree and upon the bad uh, tree. It doesn't think that I will not shine upon the bad tree. It shines upon everything. So the salt brings fullness. It gives taste. And salt preserves from uh, rottening. How can you preserve the product? so that it will not perish you have to put salt salt even changes the color of the meat or vegetables they're preserved when you put salt the same way the covenant with God will preserve us in this uh, corruption from this corruption in this world we already have corrupted bodies but when we begin to enter into the covenant with God we begin to put salt on our life and the more we want to live and eat this unleavened bread or live an, uh, a clean life the stronger your covenant will be with God because uh, the bigger sacrifice the more salt you need to put so that's how you can maybe see perhaps how to increase your personal relationship with God or a covenant by just bringing a larger sacrifice to God we need to be light and salt to this world you remember in the New Testament it says but in the Jewish context to be the light for the Jewish people it means to be the light first of all for your own people because when he shared this he shared it in Israel of course when you spread the gospel it's not just for the Jews of course uh, it was just a starting point of course if I live for example in Kazakhstan I need to be light to my own people in Kazakhstan if I'm a Kazakh but I'm talking about uh, the context of this passage uh, we have to be the light inside of our own people in order to show them this Messiah through our life to sanctify it to our people there are many other verses that speak of us as a uh, priestly uh, we're a holy priesthood uh, we know that the scripture Peter gave to the Jewish people so it was uh, in the context it was referred to the Jewish people so he calls us to be the light and to be the salt in this world when the Jewish believers began to go out of Israel it was like the salt that is spread in different meal and it changes the taste of the meal so they began to to put salt with their lives in the whole world something that others could not do uh, before the Jewish people and so what happened is the Jews they with time they began to keep this light just for themselves originally God intended it to be for other people the chosen nation when it speaks about the chosen nation the, the Hebrew word is used precious nation actually precious nation when he speaks about royal priesthood you are royal priesthood a holy nation he says chosen generation to the Jews which means precious generation a precious nation 
It's like you have gold, you have money, you have coins, but separately you also have a small case where you have a precious stone. Or special other special stones and they're too big you cannot carry them and you keep it separately and when you keep it separately that's called precious so in comparison with other uh, precious or uh, stones special stones you have a special precious stone of course God looks at every uh, nation in a special way but he also has a precious stone which he calls Israel that's why there should be no envy in other nations there should be a blessing because he said to Abraham who he blesses you I will bless who he cur will curse you I will curse and if someone speaks curse openly it will be poured out to him the curse will be poured out to him openly if someone curses inside of him it will still come into his life maybe not so openly but it will come because the word of God does not return void without fulfilling what it was sent for so all what's written here is the words of truth in Deuteronomy chapter 30 15 it says when God turns to the Jews he says today I offered you life and death good and evil choose I gave you both sides of choice he said I love you so much I leave you the right to choose that's why our covenant with God keeps us from perishing, from sin. The bread with salt is a symbol that uh, Yeshua lives in us and we live in Yeshua. You know, in our culture we bring bread with salt, leaven salt, but but you ask any Protestant believer if he thinks if he is spiritually Jew or son of Abraham, he will say yes, of course. Of course he is not a Gentile, but in terms of Matzot and everything, this is only for the Jews, they say. I offer you to look over again. Uh, look at these things again from the beginning because there's this balance when we separate these things we do not uh, need to look at these things nationalistically because it's uh, the word of God it's a spiritual foundation it has to direct our life and not nationalistic uh, ideas so the man who lives without faith in God it's like eating food without salt he eats but he's not satisfied he doesn't like this food but to a believer everything is good he thanks God for everything because he lives with God I want to tell you even the most difficult day that I had with God I would not exchange it with the most uh, wonderful life without Him with the most luxury life without Him because in the diffi most difficult time you experience intimacy with Him you begin to change and we experience this daily this is the covenant with God this is the soul that kills this corruption in us it, it cleans us completely and if someone lacks something 
he lacks the covenant with God. And when he enters into the covenant with God, he will see. When you have even a piece of pita bread with, with uh, hummus, olives, but with God, nothing else you need more than that. But if you're ready to live like this, God will give you even more. Because He wants you to bless Him all the time. Because thankful heart thanks God for everything, for good marriage, f food, even simple but good, any food. Proverbs say it's better to have a piece of green with love than uh, than with uh, to live in a big rich house but with contention you know like a wife who comes and uh, uh, has a saw in her hands and is ready ready to cut you with your word with her words speaks in proverbs regarding the grumpy wife so the feast of the first sheaf several biblical names in Leviticus 23.10 it says your first harvest the second name is the day of the first fruit also biblical names Leviticus 28.26 and the Sirata Omer which is the uh, counting of the days of counting for Gomer for Gomer I, this is what's the right name of the uh, pronunciation I don't know in Russian it says different way Homer Omer that's how we'll spell it right now that's how you spell the word Homer Omer, that's how you spell the word Omer. The counting of Omer. Leviticus 23.10, I'm repeating the verses. Numbers 28.26 and also... Leviticus 23, I want you to remember, it, it describes all the feasts. Now, uh, there is also a feast in Israel, it's not biblical, it's called uh, Lag Ba Omer. Lag in the Omer, it's not a biblical holiday. It is connected to one specific date. This feast is not biblical in Israel, but they, uh, some of them celebrate it. It's like a process. It's like a procession. Because you know the feast of the counting of the Omer is you start counting from the Passover and then you count until the Shavuot, until the day of Pentecost, 49 days. Every day you count. That's why it's called the counting of Omer. 
the counting of the harvest. The second century, maybe 120 AD, there was a rabbi, very popular rabbi, called Akiva, Rabbi Akiva. He was a very strong opposer and did wrong uh, against the messianic movement, not just messianic movement or even uh, the Judaism. He uh, rebuked a lot of things in Judaism. In this time, in his school, rabbinical school, there was uh, some sickness that would kill a lot of people. That would kill a lot of people. And so on the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer, this epidemic sickness uh, stopped. This epidemic that was killing a lot of people stopped. And in Hebrew, in the letters, 33 is Lamet and Gimel, Lag. That's 33, number 33, on the, on the 33rd day it stopped. It's, uh, some people say it's a biblical holiday, but I don't think the believer have to celebrate it because it, there is nothing uh, about our s savior or any information about our redeemer, redemption. So it's, uh, one omer is about 3.9 liter almost like four liters. When to celebrate it? In Hebrew, in Leviticus, uh, it says, 23, in 23, it says to celebrate it the day after Saturday, the next day after Saturday. This subject became uh, a controversy between Pharisees and Sadducees because Pharisees consider that you need to bring it on the second day of the feast, on the 16th of Nisan, doesn't matter on which day it falls. In, uh, even that it's called Saturday. On the 16th of Nisan, the sacrifice was brought. The 14th was the Passover, and the 16th of Nisan, the next day after the Saturday. Look, I will draw time frame for you. Here you have Friday. Here you have Saturday. And here you have Sunday. The Passover was on Friday night. But even if it wasn't on Friday, it always starts on 14th of Nisan, the 14th of Nisan, in the evening. The next day, here is the day. 15th of Nissan, and this is, is 16th of Nissan. In the night, they would have to bring this sheaf the next day, the 16th. It falls here. 
It's the night of Saturday, but it's an evening falling into Sunday. Falling into Sunday. That's when it starts. I will explain later why we need to know it. Now the Sadducees thought that you need to uh, do it on the first Sunday after the Saturday. So this feast would always have to be on Sunday. And this uh, gap could be in seven days, with seven days, because of the moving out of the days. I like more the, f I, I hold on to the Pharisee, uh, Pharisees belief, not the Sadducees, because in reality, it's very, it's impossible to like, to see according to the letter. But if the Passover is called also Shabbat, and you have to celebrate after the Shabbat, it always falls on the 16th of Nisan. But in the main Passover, for the whole man humanity, it all coincided that there was no controversy between Pharisees and, and Sadducees because everything, the Passover at that time, coincided with the Friday. So uh, that Passover, when it was during Jesus, it coincided and, and removed any thought of controversy if it was of God or not, because it coincided with Friday and Saturday. The Friday was, uh, the Passover was uh, on Friday. Some people say uh, no. They say that it's one of the theories. No, it's written in the Bible. That, and that year, the Passover, it felt was Friday, Saturday. It was a great day because it coincided with Saturday, the day of Saturday. And it started Friday night. The Lord did His Passover the day before because when they would take Jesus from the cross, they said, we need to bury Him before the Saturday. He was crucified in on Friday. And then the Passover started Friday night and Saturday was the Passover day. That's what's written in the Gospel. It says evening of Shabbat. Every feast is Shabbat. It's called Shabbat in Hebrew. In Hebrew, in Russian we have, or in other languages we have Friday night, but in the New Testament it says the night of Shabbat. I know that Hebrew is the most uh, close to the Greek, but it doesn't mean that this was not the Friday, the day of Friday. <coughs> it doesn't prove that it was Wednesday or Thursday. There's one of the series that it fell on, on Wednesday. It fell on Wednesday, so we cannot concretely say. Yes, but I, I uh, assert it based on the scriptures. I take responsibility that it coincided with Saturday. It's not a secret. There's no controversy because it doesn't say that the feast uh, started. It says that it's Saturday because of Saturday. Yes, it's true that Passover is called Saturday. But in the New Testament, it doesn't say that the pass that the the, the 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 start of the Passover is because the Saturday was, and it was Passover. And it was a great Passover, it says, because uh, it coincided with Saturday. Of course, any, not any, but this feast, the Passover, is called Shabbat. Yes and Amen. 
it's called Shabbat. But if you consider it this way, it doesn't mean that it happened on, on Thursday or Wednesday. It's very uh, legitimate to think that it was on uh, Saturday, Friday, Saturday. Moreover, I think why it happened, it coincided with Friday, Saturday. The New Testament says, when did Jesus uh, raise from the dead? First day of the week, it says. First day of the week in Israel is Sunday. It goes after the seventh day, after Shabbat. This is my, uh, my uh, apologetics. If it happened on Wednesday, then Yeshua would have to be, uh, be raised on Thursday. The Bible says he was uh, he, he raised on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, which means he had to die on Friday. You can uh, think that way, but I, I think it's a very very weak theory. I want to clearly understand. I want to clearly explain to you how to choose your position. If in the percentage-wise, I would write to you right now the position that I expressed. To my opinion, 98% it, it matches with the New Testament, and 2% is left for some assumption that maybe it coincided with other days. But it says the first day of the week, which is Sunday, he was raised. The first day of the week is Sunday. So you cannot uh, move backward. He's, uh, his death and uh, burial. So this apologetics, you know, if it's 98%, even if it's 70% against 30, I still choose this position. So I thank a brother who, who raises up these questions. Of course, we discuss these things. It's good to talk about other commentaries, of course, in the lectures, then you choose what you think is right. The continuation of this feast, the feast of the first sheep, was only one day, the 16th of Nisan. And it would start the period of the harvest of the grain harvest until the Shavuot, until the day of the Pentecost, you would be able to bring your first fruit. You know, living in Israel, here the wheat is uh, grown much faster than other places because of the climate and by the period of the Pentecost it will be already uh, reap, ripe why would they bring the barley you think the barley because in this time this period of time only out of the grain bread the barley uh, is uh, uh, reaped before the flower and before the wheat before the wheat the question was about the second Passover when it happens the second Passover then all the things move well the second Passover is made for those who missed the first Passover or were outside or were not together with everyone else but never it would be uh, underlined to conduct the second Passover it's only for those who didn't have not time to uh, you know was late in, in, uh, in his way or was was unclean perhaps he was not able to do the Passover so uh, a month later he did the Passover for example, in our family, when my daughter got married, it, uh, their, their uh, traveling the, for their honeymoon, 
which my mother bought for them to fly to Switzerland they it happened exactly during the Passover so they said we'll do the Passover in one month after we return so uh, they did it it was uh, people do that in Israel but there's no point to speak about the second Passover although thank you for mentioning and adding it to the material that we're sharing it's making it uh, much more qualified this offering of the new harvest uh, barley because of which the whole harvest was sanctified the first sheaf is removed and when it's brought in the temple all other harvest the rest of the harvest is already sanctified by the begin by the first fruit of the sheaf what's the meaning i'll tell you even today in israel on some products you have this word uh word bikurim you know uh, that it's uh, it has uh, the first uh, the first uh, grain or the fir use of the first grain the first fruit of the grain they put it on the product also uh, which means kosher is something that uh, the first grain or the first fruit of this product is actually taken out or sanctified so even today in Israel in the products is used in the culture is used it's not dead or old it works today you can check it but what's interesting is that even Apostle Paul uses this principle when he writes in the New Testament for example in Romans 11 verse 16 11 16 he says for if the first fruit is holy the lump is also holy and if the root is holy so are the branches so if the first fruit is holy the rest is holy as well what was the central act of the first sheaf you would bring this uh, sheaf and the high priest would uh, raise it he would not shake it like in our translations it says uh, shaking of the sheaf but in the Old Testament nowhere it says about shaking it says lifting or raising up the sheaf lifting up the sheaf showing to God and would put it down to where it was they would show the first fruit to God who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth here I have for example yeah it's not uh, barley but just an example how they did it this is Hisa but to show you how they would raise the barley how they would raise the sheaf they would lift it N not shaking it but they would raise it even you see if you shake it it, it drops definitely not uh, the right way not knowing the language when I read only the Russian Bible and I in the Russian it says shaking instead of lifting or raising I would always affiliate it with, with Gentiles you know how can it be that they would shake it only you know it, it looks like more heathens like shaman you know those people that would that would shake their body or vibrate you know why why this word is used in our language but when I read it in Hebrew I realized I breathed freely and I understood that in reality there is no shaking it's lifting up of the sheaf 
Also when the sacrifice is brought as an animal, do you know which parts of uh, the animal is given to the high priest? The chest, the breast, the breast. And the loin. In Hebrew also it says they would show it, they would not shake it. And the uh, loin. The loin. That's the part of the animal, the best part basically. So this is the back part of the animal, it's the best part. The was also called the batik, or the loin, so the best part with the batik. The best part, the loin is the best part of, uh, the back and the loin is the best part of, uh, uh, of the strongest point in the body. From people, uh, and uh, this part of the animal would be given to them also. It depends. Also, your strength is dependent on on loins. So there is a meaning why it would be given to the priest. So it's not an honest theme. I just wanted to 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 tell you. So the law commands to bring this chief in the evening with the two stars in the sky. That's when the day started in the evening. And so when they would lift this uh, sheep, then they would uh, use the seed, the, the, the grain, and they would bring it to the temple for service. All this would be taken from a small bunch of uh, the sheep. And then the rest of it would go to the priest, but only after the ceremony he would be able to, to take. Only after bringing it first to the temple, then he took his part. Before bringing the sacrifice, he would not be able to take no meat, no sacrifice, no flour for himself. Remember who sinned? By doing the other way is the sons of Ilya. Sons of Ilya. So the meaning of this feast is that uh, that God gave the harvest, and by this first part, the whole sac harvest was sanctified. Also, with hala, with the bread. Shabbat bread when we that it blesses the whole Shabbat according to Leviticus 2 it's not a piece of bread it's a it's a doll that is sanctified for Saturday when a woman would make bread some families would do it together in order that the Saturday bread would be distinguished from the rest of the bread for the whole week, they would separate it, and they would do they would make it in in a different form. So you could you could distinguish it from the other bread for the whole week. The it would uh, be made made. Uh, to sanctify the whole week, the first part of Hala, the Saturday bread would be made to sanctify other bread. 
it would look differently even. It would look like uh, when women put uh, hair together. Um, so the dough is called hala. The first part. When they would eat it in Shabbat, uh, 